Willful blindness starts life, so to speak, as a legal concept, uh, where if there's something that you could know and you should know, but you somehow manage not to know, you're deemed in law to be willfully blind. And what the law says is you're still responsible for it as if you had known it. And, you know, I think that's just an incredibly interesting idea that stuff you could know and should know you're responsible for. Well, I encountered the concept of, of willful blindness when I was researching two plays that I wrote about Enron. And it cropped up there in the judge's instruction to the jury. And at the time that I was writing those plays, the banks were all collapsing. And I remember sitting in my kitchen thinking, hang on a second, how could it possibly be that nobody saw this coming? This isn't possible. They ha people had to have known, even if they then tried very hard not to know. And then I thought, well, there's a great deal in life that's like that, of stuff that we do kind of know, but we don't really want to know, and so we sort of somehow manage not quite to know. But back in our minds, we really do know. You know, I think you can explain a lot of the economic chaos we've gone through recently as governments and economists and bankers being willfully blind to a lot of the stuff that they knew somehow deep down inside just couldn't possibly work. So what really interested me about once I had the idea of willful blindness is I thought, well, actually, you see it everywhere. You see it in the fact that people build up big credit card debts that they don't really want to think about, so they don't open the envelopes when they come every month. You see it in people who don't go for their medical checkups. You see it in people who know they really shouldn't smoke, but do. You see it in people who kind of think, well, their husband or wife is behaving strangely, but then they say, oh, it's because he's tired or she's working too hard or she's preoccupied by the kids, but at the back of their mind, they know there's really something wrong, you know, and two years later, they discover that the spouse was having an affair. You see it in all walks of life from kind of, you know, s domestic details like that to the very simple, if uncomfortable fact that almost all child abuse happens within families. You know, it isn't the stranger that you have to be afraid of, it's your uncle. And so it's happening, you know, child abuse happens in families where it's visible, but somehow everybody would prefer not to see it. Um, it happens hugely in medicine, where everybody in a hospital will know so-and-so isn't a very good doctor, or so-and-so is quite a cruel nurse. but people will just turn a blind eye. So I would argue it exists in every walk of life. I don't think there is a single human being who isn't touched by it. And I think it's something we need to be aware of because the reality is that when you turn away from these things that make you uncomfortable, what you do is you give them space and time to grow. So although you may feel better that when you look away, you think it goes away, the reality is you're actually making the problem worse. You know, if you take the publishing industry, everybody will say, oh, God, e-books, please don't, let's talk about it. You know, let's not talk about the Internet, let's not talk about digitization, and please don't mention the music industry. Um, you know, and everybody knows it's out there, but they're all kind of, you know, pulling the wool over their own eyes and hoping and hoping and hoping it'll just go away. Uh, film industry is doing exactly the same thing. Um, you know, with just no excuse. Um, so it's really interesting. It just doesn't matter what area you go into, you know, whether it's domestic, whether it's social, whether it's to do with entertainment or work or government or climate change or WikiLeaks or whatever. It's just anywhere you look, you see it. And I think, you know, one of the really interesting things about WikiLeaks has been there's an awful lot of kind of gossip going around at the moment that after governments, WikiLeaks looks at companies. And, you know, the only reason that that's powerful as a threat is because companies are sitting on top of problems that they know about that they don't want to look at. WikiLeaks is, is absolutely impotent if we aren't willfully blind. But as long as we are willfully blind and we have those sort of secrets from ourselves, then the Cassandras who insist on revealing them will always have tremendous power. 
there are a lot of people in the world who seem to see things better than others. And I call these people Cassandras, you know, after the, the character in Greek mythology who could see the future but was doomed never to be believed because whistleblowers are Cassandras. People who insist on not being willfully blind are Cassandras. And what's really interesting is I looked at a whole host of these kinds of people in all walks of life around the world who had seen dangers and risks and threats and tried terribly hard to warn people about them. I tried to figure out was there any kind of common theme among all these people. There's a myth out there that they're more likely to be female than male. That's definitely not true. There's a myth that they're, um, that they're always kind of outsiders. That's sort of true. Uh, there's a myth that they're mad, which is definitely untrue. I think what's really interesting about them is that they're very ordinary. So I interviewed this fantastic woman who runs a cafe for uh, soldiers in Fort Hood in Texas, which is where a lot of the uh, soldiers serving in uh, Afghanistan are based. For years, she said, these soldiers are not being sufficiently well treated when they come back. And they're very distressed individuals, and there's going to be a lot of violence. Well, of course, there was a lot of violence at Fort Hood. When I talked to her, I mean, first of all, she's an incredibly engaging, interesting woman. But you know, there's nothing special about Cynthia. She's not a psychologist. She's not, uh, she hasn't been in the army herself, though most of her family has been. There's nothing that would have given her this insight. She's just an ordinary person who kept seeing things over and over again and thought, you know, there is going to be a problem. And then she decided to do something about it, which was to set up Under the Hood Cafe to try to provide some sort of spiritual and emotional sustenance and support to people. Similarly, Deborah Layton, who tried to stop the Jonestown Massacre. Similarly, the whistleblower who dug into Madoff and understood that you know, something was very, very badly wrong here. What's so striking about all of these people is that deep down inside, they're very, very ordinary. And what that shows us, I think, is that our own capacity to see is much greater than we think it is. And we actually have the ability, in being better sighted, to bring a greater contribution to the world than we're necessarily aware of on an everyday basis. And I think these women and men, who I had the tremendous good fortune to meet and interview, I think they're incredibly inspiring. Because they're very ordinary people doing very heroic things that really do change the world. Well, one of the most interesting examples of willful blindness I came across um, is I decided to dig into the uh, horrific explosion that occurred in 2005 at BP's Texas City refinery. And I chose to do that because I wanted to look at a big global company where people would know the company and they wouldn't feel, oh, it was just England or it was just America or it was just China or whatever. Um, and so I, I, and also the the Texas City explosion had been very, very, very rigorously researched by external third parties like the Chemical Safety Standards Board. So I wanted a lot of documentation that was by people who weren't involved in it, so therefore very reliable. And what all of the investigation into the Texas City explosion showed was that for years BP had been warned that the site was highly unsafe. For years they had been told that the safety standards were low and that it was a very dangerous place to work. For years they had had workers saying to them, somebody's going to die soon because of the way you're running this place. And so there was massive evidence that the information they needed to run the plant safely was available. In other words, they could have known and they should have known. And that wasn't being argued by me, that was being documented by all kinds of highly reputable third parties. So I was very interested in, okay, if they could have known and they should have known, how come they didn't know? So I went to Texas City, I talked to a lot of the people who were involved in it, some of them who'd witnessed the, the explosion, um, some of them who were connected to people who had died at the explosion. I came back from my trip, I started writing up the book, 
and of course one of the things that everybody had said to me is you know I know it was 2005 I know BP had big fines I know everybody promised to do better next time but you know really it hasn't changed and really it's bound to happen again and I was in, midst, in the midst of writing the book and of course Deepwater Horizon exploded I remember driving in a car and, and hearing that there had been a big explosion in the Gulf and the first thing I thought was it has got to be BP and um, they could have known and they should have known and they didn't know you know that was that was very shocking I think it remains very shocking and it raises some very difficult questions about institutionalized willful blindness and what corporate leaders do to avoid it I mean I think the thing about willful blindness is it absolutely is human nature some of it is built into our neuro neurological architecture if you like but nevertheless I would argue that there are lots of things you can do to be better sighted and some of those are personal and some of them are, are institutional um, you know the personal things may come across as very trivial but they're astonishingly important one of the reasons that the uh, plant at Texas City blew up is because everybody was so tired and you know we run a lot of corporations these days in this very heroic style where anybody who works all night is considered to be you know a great guy and you know gee if you never take a vacation it shows what a hero you are well actually if you look at the damage that sleep deprivation does to your brain this is not heroic it's stupid exactly the same applies to multitasking if you look at what happens to the brain when you're texting or when you're on the phone this is not something you should be doing while you're driving we have this romantic fantasy that our brain has infinite capacity all the scientific evidence shows us that it doesn't it has a very finite capacity so if you're doing one thing you're not doing another if you're texting you're not paying attention if you're not sleeping your brain capacity is declining these you know these are very obvious horribly well documented facts which we persist in ignoring so one way to be less willfully blind you know is pay attention focus don't do a million things at once and do get a good night's sleep terribly obvious makes a very big difference um, as far as large organizations are concerned of course um, how they're structured makes a very big difference what happens to truth tellers makes a very big difference and how you institutionalize dissent in organizations makes a very big difference I would argue that most corporations are very uncomfortable with dissent and therefore consciously or unconsciously suppress it and yet I also know talking to chief executives around the world their biggest single worry is they don't know what's going on well people inside the organization know what's going on so the question for any business leader is how do you create a culture in which people will tell you surveys that I've done and that other academics have done show that a, a large majority of any workforce feels it can't raise problems at work that's pretty scary and the reality is as a business leader you can't see everything so you better ensure that the people around you do well I think one of the things I love about this book is it's the first book I've ever written where, that my kids actually want to read um, I mean it really it really does relate to everybody from you know family members to individuals to corporations to business executives to husbands wives investors auditors accountants doctors nurses scientists you name it because willful blindness is a human foible it isn't you know it's not a business foible business after all is just made up of human beings um, so it applies really to everybody I mean it's funny because you know since writing about it I notice it all the time I notice I can put a, a basket of laundry at the bottom of the stairs and everybody in my family can walk right past it as if it doesn't exist um, you know I can so you can take very trivial examples like that 
you can see people in pubs who decide to let somebody drive home even though they know they've drunk too much and they're kind of being willfully blind both to their own moral responsibility and to their friends. Um, you can see willful blindness in the news almost every day. I was amazed the other day I picked up the paper JP Morgan and HSBC are being sued for willful blindness over their involvement in the Madoff affair. Willful blindness is all around us. Now, that doesn't mean we just shrug our shoulders and say, oh, well, we're just flawed human beings. You know, there's a lot we can do about it. But the first thing we have to do is notice when we're doing it. My husband pointed out to me, I'm willfully blind because I don't have any mirrors in my house. I don't have any mirrors in my house because I don't want to look at myself. <laughs> it's a spectacular example of willful blindness. You know, I don't want to see myself getting older or fatter or more and more exhausted. So there's a great solution, which is don't have any mirrors. There definitely are um, examples of positive willful blindness. Um, probably the, the most famous I can think of is, you know, London in the Blitz was famous for party going and people having a great time on the grounds that, you know, you, there's nothing you can do about it, so you may as well actually keep your own morale up by having fun. I think that's actually quite a fundamental thing. I was hearing the other day that, um, you know, Shackleton insisted when he and his men left the Endurance when it was frozen in the ice and went to Elephant Island, he insisted on taking a banjo. You know, a banjo is a very useless item, but it's about keeping up morale. And at any point where you're being cheerful despite horrible circumstances, that's a very, very positive form of willful blindness. There are times in my own life when you know, the news about the outside world is so awful that I've switched to listening to classical music because I can't do anything about it and it's so depressing. What I need for myself is to feel positive about something. So there absolutely is a positive aspect to willful blindness and in desperate circumstances it probably aids our survival which is probably why it's still part of our makeup but that doesn't mean it's always useful. I spent 17 years in broadcasting and then I spent oh about 15 years running businesses in the US and the UK uh, media and technology businesses and really throughout my career, people have said to me, oh, Margaret, you really should write. And I always said, but I have nothing to say. You know, the world doesn't really need more writers with nothing to say. And there just came a point in my life where I thought, actually, now there is something I really want to say. And I started writing because I felt that the way people wrote about the world of work didn't feel very real to me. There was an awful lot of rather um, starchy economics and a lot of matrices with formula for how to make businesses successful. And I thought, you know, this is all rubbish. It doesn't work like that. The fundamental aspect of work and business is human beings. Why does everybody talk about it as if it's not human? So that's really the sort of perspective from which I started writing about um, business. And... I ended up writing Willful Blindness, which really isn't specifically a business book, but partly because I thought it was a tremendous human theme that connected all the different aspects of how we live and work together. And so it doesn't really separate the social individual from the working individual. In fact, I'd argue that one of the things that makes us willfully blind is this artificial division between work and the rest of life. You know, we are whole people who have many, many forms of self-expression of which work is one. And we're the same people at work as we are at home. We just are doing different things with different latitude. So that's really why I started to write and why I keep writing, because I look around me and I think, I don't understand what's going on here. I don't understand what the drivers or motives are. Why are we so stupid? You know, why are we so um, foolish? Why do things not work the way people say they should work? And that's really what drives me, is trying to understand why things don't work the way we think they ought to. The thing I'm really obsessed by at the moment, and I think really to write a book, you have to be obsessed. 
and I like being obsessed. I'm unhappy when I'm not obsessed by something. Um, but the thing I'm obsessed by now is competition. I'm very interested in why we're competitive, how competition works. And I'm particularly interested that people seem to think that competition is either absolutely good or absolutely bad. If it's absolutely good, you can trust the world to it. And if it's absolutely bad, then you have to eradicate it. Well, we know you can't trust the world to it. And I would argue we also know that you can't eradicate it because it's too fundamental a part, not just of human nature, frankly, but all nature. And so I'm kind of trying to understand better how does the engine of competition work inside of us? How does that play out? individually and socially and how if we understood it better what might we manage it better because I do think it is the great motivator and I know that free market economists say no the great motivator is selfishness I think that's rubbish I said it tells you everything about them and nothing about us um, and certainly Darwin would say you know the great engine of evolution is competition and yet I think we have very, very little insight into how it works. So that's what obsesses me at the moment.